Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Brussels Signal podcast. It is with great pleasure that I can welcome Eric Kaufmann to today's podcast. Uh, and I'm very happy, particularly because Eric, if I recall correctly, I think we first talked was it four years ago or five years ago? It must have been must have been quite a while ago. And you have been very active and very productive since then. So I'm really, really glad that you found the time to talk to me again and to talk to our new podcast, especially since I have to admit you were somewhat of a trailblazer in many areas. You wrote about demography when barely anybody was talking about it. Um, you have been one of the first ones to look at issues like Gen Z, something that is now very, very familiar for those who follow Jonathan Haidt and others. But you have been touching on this. You have been touching on the on the connection of demography and religion. Uh, we saw recently the interview with Richard Dawkins, who apparently seems to now recant at least parts of his atheism. So I think in many ways you have then the you, you preceded or foresaw some of these debates that have now fully entered the, the mainstream debate. Uh, and I think it's also fair to say that this has affected your career quite a bit. So maybe we can talk about this a little <laughs> bit later. Now, you have written a plethora of books. We mentioned all of them in the description of the podcast. For those of you interested, you can get them on Amazon. Uh, many of them are also available on, on Kindle. So I highly recommend that you take a look. Uh, I think there's a couple of podcasts coming out in the future with also very prestigious uh, media ventures, if I might say so. So please also follow Eric on Twitter to follow his, his work there. But if you would have the opportunity, kinda, if you would reflect on your work of the past decade, what do you think was your most important work? Uh, uh, what do you think? Will you go into more depth? And is there also something that you might would write differently today if you would could, if you could revisit some statements that you made in the past? <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Ralph. I mean, there's a lot there, and I'm I'm very flattered uh, by uh, probably. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, really, I guess if you go back really 30 years, you know, to when I was doing my PhD. Um, at the London School of Economics, you know, I think there were basically three strains, three things I was interested in, in the PhD. I mean, one was demographic around migration and ethnic change. The other is uh, to do with the, the cultural left. Again, I looked at, again, at an earlier phase, the liberal left, particularly on the cultural side, going into the early 20th century and forward. Um, and then this other is this question of national identity or, or, or ethnic ethnic majorities. So that those three strands have kind of been a constant throughout uh, much of what I've done. Not everything, but much of what I've done. So actually, my PhD was really about the decline of the WASP historically, the Anglo-Protestant ethnic majority in the U.S. as a result of immigration, which in, in a way was affected to some degree by this cultural liberalization. And so that's something that I revisited really in the in the book White Shift in 2010, where it's really the same question that in, in many ways that preoccupied the US through the late 19th, early 20th century around immigration and ethnic change. Um, now, of course, the ideological climate was a little bit different then. Um, and then the, the book on shall the religious inherit the earth, um, which which was uh, Sorry, that was written in 2010. White Shift is, is a 2018 book, but the 2010 Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth was a bit of a, it's somewhat of a detour, but I was very interested in, you know, okay, this we have this end of history thesis, you know, liberalism as the end goal, what what might upset or derail that? It's not going to be communism, it's not going to be fascism, it, it, it's not going to be an, an economic collapse, I don't believe that. But demographically, it is, has a weak spot, and that's something that I was interested in, in the sense that conservative religious groups had consistently higher fertility and higher membership retention than the more liberal religious groups or seculars. And if you run that sort of demographic model forward, what does that look like as we enter into a, a depopulation phase and we go through a bottleneck and we're going to come out that other side of that evolutionary bottleneck, what will the remaining islands of humanity look like um, after this period of very low fertility. And I think that's sort of where I got interested in the sort of strict religious groups and the Amish and the ultra-Orthodox Jews and these groups that have very high fertility, maintaining it generation after generation in the face of a society where fertility rates, birth rates are just dropping and dropping and dropping. So that, that was kind of the origin of that book. And I think, if anything, those questions are now even more... Uh, relevant and they i mean they were already relevant but the trends have just deepened and deepened since then um and so that's that's sort of one area of focus but 
the one that I was had focused on in my PhD was really this question of ethnic change and populism and polarization. And it had a different a different form in the past, uh, but a lot of things are similar. And and then we had, of course, Brexit and Trump and the rise of Le Pen and all of this, uh, which is kind of and I was just providing an explanation. To me, it wasn't that surprising. I mean, whereas all these people were acting very surprised that this should happen. And then, then of course, they're now acting, well, it's a blip and it's going to go away. But of course, we know now from the polling numbers for the European elections, for the US election, that, that it's a very different story, right? So, so yeah, that's just a little background. And now, of course, the whole issue around woke and the culture war. Um, you know, if you go back to the book White Shift, a lot of the thesis was that speech restrictions prevented discussion of immigration, and that is what allowed populism to rise. So without speech restrictions on what you could talk about around immigration, you wouldn't have had the rise of Le Pen and, and Trump and all of these phenomena. Um, and so political correctness, speech restriction, is, is a central part of the story of the rise of populism. And then I would just sort of, now in my next book, which is really about the woke phenomenon, I'm just sort of majoring on that strand. Again, these three strands throughout, uh, the cultural left strand is the one I'm focusing mainly on in my next book, which is out in, in mid-May in the US called The Third Awakening. And in Britain, it's called Taboo. Won't be out till mid-June. But um, yeah, so that's a very quick and dirty, uh, uh, but I'm happy to go into detail on any one of, of those stories. Yeah, I would love to because there is a there is a couple of very interesting books have been published recently. Richard Hanania wrote about uh, um, what woke is. Um, we have uh, uh, now his name eludes me. In he's at Columbia now. He wrote this book called "We Were Never Woke." Um, ah, I, I think oh, it will come. Colum- oh, we were never woke. You know, you know I, I, is that I'm trying to remember that. Who who wrote that book? Now? Yeah, I know it's it's his name. No, it's is, not, is not, you're not thinking about no, not Coleman Hughes because he's not a Columbia. He was a graduate student there, but he's not. Uh, no, no. It, um, it, yes, it, I've heard this book. Right. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple coming out. So so I was wondering. Um, then of course Jonathan out. Heights now with the with the 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 anxious generation uh, and before that the coddling of the American mind with uh, Greg yes. Luciano and Ricky Schlott wrote the canceling of the American mind. So there's a lot going on in that space at the moment. Now, what if if in this kind of broader framework of, of new literature dealing with the issue of wokeness, and it's kind of funny you mentioned political correctness before, right? We we, we no longer use that term. Like that term has been completely completely abandoned. What is what is your theory, kind of in a nutshell? What do you, what 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 is your hunch about what's going on? And do you think we have reached, as some argue, we have reached peak woke and it's going to go downhill from here, or do you think that there will be a woke backlash against the new anti woke movement? Kind of, what is your your sense? What is your gut feeling where the journey is going? Well, yeah, I mean that book, the, my book, the Third Awakening, essentially argues that we're in our third awakening. It's not one. It's, it's not a new thing, it's the third. And what that means is that after each outburst of collective effervescence, of emotional energy, the movement then settles into a more, cons- it consolidates, it doesn't disappear, it just consolidates and becomes more institutionalized and routinized, but doesn't mean it's gone away. Uh, and then it's ready so that there, for the next time, there's gonna be another awakening. And at each awakening actually, uh, it consolidates at a higher level. So if you look at uh, uh, Google Ngram Viewer, it's a big data uh, program. It can track words in English language books. You put in racist or sexist there, and what you see is three waves. Late 1960s into the 70s, you see the first wave. Then it flattens out. Second wave, late 1980s, early 90s, we get speech codes, political correctness, all of that. Boom, another increase, then it flattens out. And then we get into the Great Awakening, mid-2010s, another explosion, flattening out again. Each time it does fall back a little bit. Um, and it's funny, it's funny you mention that. I have, I don't know, this is a podcast, but this is a book called Debating PC. It was written mm-hmm. in 1992, right? And actually, it's funny that we mention this. It's not <laughs> like this to open a book on, on a show, but there's... Um, there was a basically a show called the McNeil Lehrer News Hour, and those of us who uh, grew up when I grew up knew that show very well. Um, and Robert McNeil, who's the host of the show, interviewed Dinesh D'Souza, D'Souza who was a young student at the time. Uh, and D'Souza, he basically says, well, look, you know, um, this people have been making fun of political correctness over the past year, and surely it's something that's fading away. 
Um, don't you think it's going to fade away? And D'Souza says, well, um, the difference is this isn't just a few radical students. It is the academic establishment. It is deans. It is presidents. It is, you know, so the idea that just because uh, some people have made fun of this thing and it's been in the press and it was lampooned in the press doesn't mean it's going to disappear. And in the end, he has been proved right and McNeil's been proved wrong. This thing basically resurged again. Um, and I'd say the same thing for Woke, that, you know, it's experienced some setbacks, Claudine Gay and Elizabeth McGill and, you know, all of that that came out of the, uh, you know, the Hamas attacks and the response to that on campus. Yeah, I mean, there has been a backlash. There's been a backlash to DEI. To some degree, corporations have cut back. There's, that's all true. Uh, but uh, I would say that the core beliefs, the core belief systems remain intact and, uh, and are adhered to not just by uh, what I might, what you might call cultural Marxist radicals, but also by the liberal left. That's my argument in the book is that, the, that essentially what we have is um, the liberal left and the cultural Marxist left um, sharing the same belief system. I think woke is a continuation and not a repudiation of the, lib when I say liberalism, I mean the dominant strand of left liberalism. People are suggesting that this is an aberration and I don't think it is. I think it's building on what went before and that means that the future is going to build on what's happening now. And so, and, and you, you only have to look at the uh, attitudes of young people to know that What's coming in the future with this generation is much less tolerant of offensive speech. When they become the median employee and the median uh, president, the median voter, um, yeah, I think a lot of the freedoms we take for granted uh, could well be in peril. Now, by the way, I found it now. So the, the author we were talking about is Musa Al Garbi, and the title of the book is "We Have Never Been Woke." So I. I I found okay. it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not published yet. As far as I I'm think so. Yeah, you're right. It's not yet published. No, no. Um, that's maybe why. I, I mean, I know Musa. He's great. Um, yeah. I very much look forward to his book. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the the. So what is woke? First of all, definition, right? Um, yes. Woke is making sacred of historically marginalized race, gender, and sexual minority groups. That's woke. What follows from that is a kind of set of philosophical principles. But it's important to note the philosophical principles are not in the driver's seat. It's the attachments to particular groups, this emotional attachment to some groups and fears of other groups. So it's fear of the majority, white majority, men, attachment to and feelings for the sacred groups. And that is the emotional structure. Now, what follows from that kind of is a sort of set of moral intuitions, which are kind of hazy, but basically go like, well... Um, if you have more oppression points in, in our intersectional hierarchy, you have the right to speak, your voice gets heard, your wants get priority uh, over those who have fewer points. And so maybe women, uh, you know, maybe they're a seven or an eight in the pack of cards, but trans gets a 10 or, a, uh, you know, a 10 or a jack in the pack of cards. So the, the trans defeats the woman in this trade-off. Um, but so you have this kind of philosophy which says equal outcomes, and emotional harm protection for these historically disadvantaged groups. That's the philosophy. Um, I think that philosophy actually has deeper roots. And you could see the same thing in this in these debates in the early 90s over political correctness. It was all around race and gender and to some degree sexuality. So nothing's really changed. There's trans. Yeah, that's new. But basically, the basic outlines of the debate were there. The issues around affirmative action and speech suppression were there. The debates look very familiar. Um, not much has, has changed. Hate speech versus free speech, et cetera, et cetera. They use different terms then, self-esteem and sensitivity instead of microaggressions and emotional trauma. Okay, somewhat different terms, but basically the same issues were at stake. What surprises me sometimes is, just as we mentioned, there is now a lot of literature coming out about 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 wokeness and what it is and, and, and what potentially could be done about it. But is there also like a text, they say, that we would call the, the, the woke manifesto, if you want, right? If, if you look at something like Marxism or other ideologies, like they, you know, political Islam, right? They have kind of their founding text. So one would say you, you go back to these texts and they define 
the, the main parameters of the ideology in question, the main ideas, kind of the, including maybe even how it is supposed to be implemented. But do you think it would be fair to say what makes this phenomenon we're discussing so interesting and that a lot of it ba is based on, and you mentioned this in some of your books as well, is, is a sense of a, a loss of identity, particularly in the West, and such a desperate search for, for an emotional identity that it gets now projected onto this, this oppressor, oppressed kind of hierarchy, but it does not really have kind of the, the multi-layered philosophy that, for example, Marxism had, or that in its own way, fascism had or, or, no, or, 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 or German romanticism had. Do you think that would be a fair assessment that it's much more emotive than kind of a, of a, of a political or ideological program? And that, I think, sometimes makes it, makes it hard to grasp. Yeah, I think you, you, you put your finger on it. You know, you have um, two dimensions here. I mean, one is that this is more empathizing and emotional than systemic. There's this distinction between empathizing and systematizing, which I can't remember his name. I think it's a psychologist who's written about this. Uh, so, so you have this as a more empathizing rather than systematizing. It's more emotional. Um, I think I think an analogy can be made between Calvinism versus Pentecostalism as in, within Protestantism. You know, Calvinism is doctrinal. People argue about fine points of doctrine and text. Whereas Pentecostalism, it's emotional, speaking in tongues, feeling the Holy Spirit is much. And, and I think what we're dealing with is much more the second. The other thing is it's um, radically decentralized. And, you know, if you compare Catholicism with, you know, with Protestantism, let's say, and Protestantism is, is just a bunch of preachers. I mean, granted, there are some established churches in some places, but there's more, particularly in the U.S., this idea of competing sects, competing mm. preachers. Uh, and you have waves of, you know, in the U.S., American Protestantism, we've had these great awakenings, these waves of moral, fer uh, religious fervor. Uh, and, and I would say that the woke movement is very much like that. You have competing influencers online, uh, media personalities, and you have um, people will jump in behind somebody in a Twitter mobbing. And so you have these, these eruptions of, of emotion. It's that very decentralized model, whereas Marxism and Catholicism, very centralized, they have a doctrine and the party line, and it's coming from Moscow. It's very different. I mean, maybe we're onto something. I'm just throwing this out as a provocative statement, but I'd be curious to hear a take on it. Um, when we, as you just did so so adequately, when we take this distinction between systemizing and, and emotion, right, between empathy and, and or systemic thinking, uh, and, and emotional thinking, if you want. Some would argue, like, uh, you know, some psychologists have made the argument in the past, and it has been also reflected in the literature, that uh, as human beings develop, right, uh, as they split up into male and female, that very often, the, on average, the systemizing uh, occurs more often among the male population, whereas the, the emphatic part occurs more often uh, on the, in the female part of the population. Yeah, now we, we're talking about averages here, so this does yeah, not yeah. mean that this applies to every single one. But would it then be, and this sounds more provocative than I mean it, but it seems to me to be reflective of this. Is it possible that maybe the philosophy, the idea of wokeness, has a, an almost, and I mean this not as a value judgment, but has an almost female quality to it. And would that then also explain a little bit, we saw the Financial Times recently had an article about this, right, that shows that apparently uh, young women tend to be significantly more liberal or, 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 kind of, or, or, or go into a vogue direction than, for example, young men. I think we saw, if we look at, at the, you know, the videos that come out, whether it was with uh, protests uh, against Israel in recent weeks and so there seems to be a very strong female presence. And do you think there might be a connection? I know this is a, we are we are on very thin ice here, but that seems to be an interesting I don't issue think I don't think it's particularly con I don't think it's particularly controversial. And in fact, even the uh, empathizing, systematizing distinction was almost often referred to as female brain, male brain. I think that's pretty well established that these are different modes. Um, now, as, as you say, these are sort of bell curve distributions, and and you know, obviously there's a lot of variation within each each sex. But yeah, I think that's right. Now the question, now here, and of course, Corey Clark and, and I think it was Bo Weingart did a paper on this, uh, where their argument is that woke is essentially about the demographic female rise in a number of professions like teaching and, and in universities and so on. And that's something where I, I'm slightly less convinced of that argument that it's just about the rising proportion of women in these institutions. What I think is going on is that <clears throat> some ideologies are just more uh, female or feminine in nature than other ideologies. 
and the more feminine ones are going to resonate better with women. And, and you could have probably said this in the past, you know, when we moved away from dueling uh, or we moved towards table manners or some of these things which, like Norbert and Al Elias, the sociologist, would call that feminization, even though everybody who was involved in this was male. So, so it was an all-male demography that was presiding over this feminization. And so I think what's going on is it's the ideas moving in the feminine direction. And that just happens to resonate better with women. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the data on young men and women showing a big, bigger and bigger gap, that's driven mainly by women moving left. And that, that move to the left is essentially entirely around cultural issues. Um, and it's something I'm actually just looking at right now. But, but yeah, that's, um, that's absolutely right. I think the nature of this ideology is more uh, empathizing and more uh, feminine in a way. And that's one of the reasons it appeals more to women. So this brings me to another question along this, because I think you mentioned also a little bit already in your in your remarks. When we talk about this issue, is it, do you think, mostly an upper class elite phenomenon, right? That, that this is something that is debated on Twitter, on X, that's debated among, you know, the, the media class, the, uh, the, the, the cultural class, uh, and that large parts of the population, I mean, Rob Anderson would call it luxury belief, right, that they might be affected by it in negative ways but that it's not really part of their everyday conversations. Or do you think this is something that really affects all of society and has become a broader phenomenon that affects all economic or socioeconomic classes? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, th it's a mix of both. Like, like I think if you ask uh, British or Americans, this is the only data, or Canadians, I've seen the data for all three, um, political correctness has gone too far, agree or disagree, you get around 80%. Uh, in all three societies, which I've surveyed on, saying it's gone too far. Um, so people understand the term political correctness, I would say, and, and they understand speech restrictions and speech etiquette, even if they are down the social scale. This, however, that doesn't necessarily mean people uh, fully understand all the issues, um, as well as people who are very much online. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a good example to illustrate this. I mean, one is if you say, oh, what are the most important issues facing the country? And if you put, you know, critical race theory, political correctness, cancel culture, whatever in there, um, that issue will have, a you know, in the United States amongst Republicans, it will have a higher ranking. It, it will tend to be in a middle, probably even sometimes in the upper part of the distribution. Like I got half of Republicans in one survey saying that it, that was a top three issue for them. Um, where, but in Britain and in Canada, it's a much lower ranking issue. A lot of voters don't rank cancel culture and or attacks on, on national heritage, uh, symbols, statues, street names, whatever. They don't necessarily rank that as a very high issue next to crime and the economy and immigration and other things. Um, the, the people who do rank that issue highly are much more likely to to listen to, you know, podcasts and, and watch YouTube channels that uh, are aligned with their political beliefs. Now, what I would say is like 40% of the sample that I looked at were watching uh, YouTube videos and listening to podcasts that aligned with their political beliefs. So it's a still a significant chunk of people. But that is the group where that are most attuned to the culture wars, whereas people who watch Fox News on TV, conservative TV, even read conservative newspapers, uh, they are not uh, anywhere near as as uh, they will rank culture wars at a, as a lower priority issue. Um, and so it seems like it's it's the online space. People are in the online space are much more likely to rank it a, a high ranking issue. I mean, we just recently, this has been a broad debate down the United, in the United Kingdom, right? The new hate speech law in Scotland. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, as you just said, right, if, if 80% in polls would say that political correctness, uh, restrictions on free speech have gone too far, why is it then, then, as we would assume, that politicians are kind of finger-in-the-wind types, that they say, well, the majority is there, they have to be because that's where the votes are. Why is it that they then very often seem to push against something that whether it's right or wrong, a separate issue, but they push against something where there seems to be fair or, or cl close to uniformity when it comes to attitudes towards certain things? Well, OK, but I think it partly depends on the wording of the question. So if I were to mm. say instead of has political correctness gone too far or do you agree, if I went, um, 
do you support political correctness because it protects minorities from discrimination or do you uh, are you against political correctness because it stifles free speech that question in Britain has been asked to about 200,000 people on the YouGov panel um, so we have a really good idea of how the opinion moves on that and it's like 47 37 against PC but it, so it's a much smaller when you phrase it in those terms you know, you're, you're protecting against discrimination versus stifling free speech. People have to make this choice. And, and and similarly, if you say, oh, hate speech is a problem, do you agree? You also get 80%. So what I'm saying is you have support for both sides, and it's only when you put them together in a question that you get a sense of where the splits are. And, and for example, there's a very big ideological split left to right on this question. I mean, if we take academics in Britain who are social scientists, for example, they lean about four to one in favor of PC, in favor of political correctness on that question, right? <laughs> so that sh sort of shows you that some of these subgroups in the population, particularly high education in the cultural professions, I mean, they were overwhelmingly pro-PC, I would argue. Um, and so that's what's driving this legislation. Now, I where, where the... Uh, politicians are much further away from public opinion is on things like the trans issue. So gender reassignment surgery for minors, uh, you know, biological males and women's sports, there you've got overwhelming opposition. And so I think, you know, ultimately they're doomed in a way. Any kind of right of center party, all they need to do is key into those issues. Similar to teaching kids that uh, you know, Britain is a is a racist country. America's built on stolen land. All of that is is opposed at least two to one. I would predict, therefore, that those issues we've seen it a bit in the critical race theory issue in Florida and Virginia. But I, I predict that's going to become again more prominent in um, right of center parties. Um, but but yeah, on the it's funny. People are actually much more passionate around the issue of attacking the past, attacking the white people, for example, than they are about defensive free speech. Um, and so the hate speech law, the free speech law, they can kind of get away with more. Whereas I think ultimately on the critical race and gender stuff, they're going to lose because the public opinion is so against them. But as you just say, right, I mean, this is something that one can can figure out or that one can be, the data can be gauged via, via polls. So this is something that is not a secret, if you will. So what then would, just to use an example, again, whatever one thinks about this is a different issue, but just as, a, as an example, when like uh, just a couple of days ago, um, Joe Biden announces uh, you know, Trans Visibility Day and it happens to fall on Easter Sunday. Right? I mean, again, whatever one thinks about the issue, that there will be a reaction was, you know, absolutely foreseeable. That was not a surprise. And again, wouldn't a shrewd politician have said, "Listen, we kind of we need to get the the trans community. We need them in our camp, but we also have to to be honest about that. There is, as you mentioned before, right? There is a significant chunk of the population that, let's just say, has a different take on this issue. Let's so let's try to maybe you know be a little bit more careful in the way in which we maneuver this." But that was a very much in your face, if you want, attitude by the White House. I mean, is that, let's be very cynical for a second, is that politically smart? What again, what everyone thinks ideologically, yeah. but is that a politically smart move? Um, I don't think it is, but I also think that what the woke side of the equation relies upon is large scale ignorance, or they rely upon the fact that most people's attention is elsewhere. A good example of this is the Scotland case where, you know, Nicola Sturgeon was pushing her Gender Recognition Act, trying to get it, make it much easier for minors, for example, to change their, their uh, sex on them. And, and, and all of this was sort of being pushed uh, by, by Sturgeon's SNP government. Um, very little pushback, actually. For a long time, she was getting away with it. Um, even though if you ran a survey, you'd, sh you know, what is the, the Gender Recognition Act? Most Scots, when they saw the content of it, were opposed. But because everyone's focus was just on, you know, Scottish independence vis-a-vis -vis London, it never made it uh, uh, into their consciousness until you had a tattooed male rapist sh popping up in the papers going into a women's prison. You then had the Westminster government, you know, the British government saying that they were going to be challenging the Scottish law. There was a standoff. And then Nicola Sturgeon was forced 
you know, th this uh, this um, issue was forced to the surface. It had been hiding. She hoped that maybe she could sort of put it under the radar, but it came up above the radar and eventually she was forced to resign. That's an example of what I mean is that the woke side relies very much on hiding, hiding these decisions, doing it stealthily through institutions, through codes that are not going under the radar, using euphemisms like diversity and inclusion, which basically means anti-white male or sometimes anti-Asian discrimination, for example, or the word inclusion, which means speech suppression in order to make people not be offended. So because of the euphemisms, the way this is all couched and the fact it's done under the under the radar, the, the hope on the woke side is, well, as long as we can avoid this becoming a political issue, avoid it getting into the media, we can get what we want. And I think, yeah, and I think in the case of Biden, similarly, he was sort of pandering to these very influential activists and foundations that are important in terms of his donors. Um, and he hoped he could get away with it. And, and you know, that's that's an example. I mean, it's, and, and he's hoping that this is a low enough priority issue for most swing voters that it's not going to affect his numbers. And so he can slip it through. Which kind of now, now connects back to a, a previous question of mine. Do you think that that bet is a smart bet? Do you think it, it is still kind of a, a low importance issue for most voters? Or do you think, as you mentioned before, we saw it in Virginia, we saw it in Florida with education, like the more people uh, found out what ch children are being taught in school, that something that was under the surface has now come up above. It's like the iceberg basically popped, popped up on, on the surface. Do you think that this will remain uh, an issue and that kind of the, the let's say that the stealth change of society that the stealth phase is over and that these things are out in the open will remain in the open and therefore will play a bigger role also in voting decisions um, of the the, you know, the average population or do you think that it will kind of recede back into the shadows and you know, kind of work its influence from there? Well, a lot depends on the skill of right of center politicians and how effectively they are able to wield this issue. So a good analogy is what Nigel Farage did in Britain on Brexit. He took an issue no one cared about, the European Union. No one knew what it was. They didn't really care about it. Um, and the issue they did care about was immigration. And he was able to say, well, look, if you care about immigration, you must care about the EU. Um, and so he was able to raise the uh, EU as, as a concern, which was, it was sort of in maybe a couple of percent of, of the population saying that was a top three concern. And he eventually got that up into the 40s and 50s. Similarly, when it comes to woke, I think it's going to be a much easier task, by the way, on woke, uh, whether that be cancel culture or whether it be critical race and gender ideology, but particularly critical race and gender ideology, I actually think you could get a politician that could say, you're worried about crime, you're worried about uh, a border that we can't control, you know, you're worried about homelessness, you're worried about education standards, it all comes back to one thing, and that's woke, right? So you can imagine where uh, if a politician was able to sort of make the same connection and make woke the sort of central feature of their pitch, um, they could easily raise this, this issue up. Now, of course, that would also entail having to become a lot more graphic and explicit and have some mm. very... Some very quick political communication. So, for example, this billboard, Chris, when he says, you know, oh, gender affirming, that means chemical castration of children. Some very quick, you know, a very simple line that's easy to understand. I mean, I did a, a question about this teacher in Canada who wore um, the size nine prosthetic breast. I don't know. I remember that, that, yes. <laughs> so, you know, you ask a question, should a, this teacher who wore size nine prosthetic breast be allowed to teach? And it splits pretty evenly, right? You then show a picture of the teacher and it flips to like, you know, eight to one, again, seven to one again. But that's kind of what I mean. It's the same thing as what occurred with the Isla Bryson prison case in Scotland, where you suddenly see this tattooed male going into women's jail and boom, the public opinion suddenly is galvanized, right? So, and, and what, what that means is there are various ways in which the euphemisms you can get under that rip off that velvet glove that is concealing the iron fist, right? And that's sort of where I, I can imagine politicians going is saying, okay, well, we need to sort of have the right slogans, the right communication to sort of cut through the, the euphemisms of anti-racism, diversity, equity, whatever nice sounding stuff is covering up the real agenda. A way to sort of get that off is an image, a slogan, and then tying it to uh, 
a whole series of other issues that woke is connected to, but people don't realize it. So yeah, I, I would if, if I were to say which direct what is the direction going to be for right of center parties, populist right of center parties, I think it's going to be moving in that direction going forward. And I can't see how the left is going to have a good answer to that, other than to say, you know, the current way they try and deflect that is just to say, oh, you're stoking a culture war. People only care about, uh, you know, the cost of living and healthcare. And that's, that is the way it's being done. That didn't save, um, didn't save McAuliffe in Virginia. Uh, it, I don't think it's going to save the left either, because it's not convincing after a while, especially if the other side is hammering away. But what we have is a number of right of center politicians, particularly center right politicians that are too scared still to go down that uh, path. They, they still are being rule takers when it comes to which issues they're allowed to talk about. Um, you see that in uh, Britain. You've seen that in Canada in particular. The conservative leader really reluctant to touch even an issue like you know, pronouns, informing parents of children's pronouns, he refused to say anything about it. He refused to say anything about immigration, similarly. Um, and that sort of timidity on the right is there, particularly where you have an established center-right party. Uh, and it's only when the populists come in and challenge that, that they're forced to change. Uh, so there's a whole dynamic of, of change in the politics around the culture war. But what do you think drives this timidity? I mean, you just mentioned another very important topic, right? Immigration. I mean, I think there, there are not many areas where public sentiment, at least in Europe, but I would argue similarly in the United States, is in Canada as well, where public sentiment is fairly clear uh, when it comes particularly, let's say, to non-Western immigration. I think that's always a distinction one has to make. When you ask people, what's your attitude towards immigration? I think mm -hmm. most people have a mental image of, of Lampedusa, of, you know, of, of refugees from the near Middle East. It's, it's not the... I don't know, it's not the Canadian, you know, the, the guy from Vancouver moving to Seattle or, or the, the, mm. the guy moving from Dublin to London. So I think when, when we, this I think makes often the public debate so difficult because so often also in the media, it's simply the, the general term migration is used, but people connect something very clearly to migration. And I think most people, if they're honest about the issue, know this. But why is it that even conservative leaders or, or right of center parties kind of always kind of tiptoeing around very carefully and have a very, very difficult time, even in Germany, right? They have a very difficult time being, you know, more more frontal about this issue as the populists, as you mentioned, tend to be. Yeah, I mean, I think that comes back to the power of the anti-racism taboo, <clears throat> which, and that my book talks is really focused on this as, as the central issue, right, is that the anti-racism taboo, it rises in the mid-60s in the U.S., um, and there's a sacredness around racial minority groups, initially African Americans, but later extending to indigenous, extending to other groups. Anything you say that uh, might be perceived as offending uh, the most sensitive member of one of these groups, therefore, becomes something you can be canceled for. That's really what... This is the fulcrum of our moral order that I, I say, you know, the big bang of our moral order was the anti-racism taboo. And then it expands outward and eventually we get to where even going hiking becomes racist. right? So um, it, it, the, the power of this, the cultural power of this taboo, it, it lies at the heart of all of these issues. And the only question is whether you have a, a leader who's willing to be called a racist who is willing to say, no, I'm not, you can call me it, but I'm not. And if they have the courage to do that, actually the, the population will come behind them, but they have to then be willing to face down the elite culture. A lot of this is elite norms, right? It is not mass public opinion, but it's the, the dinner parties the politicians go to, the uh, TV studios they get invited to. There is a kind of code at the elite level that you have to abide by if you want to be seen as a good a member in good standing in polite society. So somehow the uh, this anti-racism taboo, which is extended to become an anti-sexism, anti-homophobia taboo, but without any boundaries as to what is real racism or not real racism, right? So it, there's a real incentive to sort of weaponize this and stretch it. Um, and, and that's become the ethos of um, elite institutions. And it's such a dominant power that even members of right-wing parties feel they have to bend to it. Now, there are different gradations. So, I mean, certainly in the U.S. case, there's no question the Trump takeover of the Republican Party has has ended that to a very large extent, not entirely, but much more so. So, you know, if you went back to 2008, for example, 
um, Republicans wouldn't criticize affirmative action for fear of being seen as racist. I don't think that exists anymore. Um, and so there has been a change. There's no question that the Republican Party is less sensitive than they once were to some of these charges. Um, but I, I would say certainly in Canada or Britain, I don't think that, that that's been the case. I think the establishment remains in control. They remain rule takers from the progressives uh, in the elite institutions. And so they're reluctant really to, to cross that line. And, and immigration is a good, good issue. Now, I think a lot of European politicians are willing to talk about, or at least some are willing to talk about reducing numbers, particularly since the populist right is, is you know, barking at their heels. But in a place like Britain or especially Canada, you know, Canada's got ridiculous out of control immigration and the mainstream conservative parties unwilling to criticize the liberals for letting migration get insanely out of control. It's just, it's really astounding. Uh, but that kind of shows you the taboo is remains totally intact and it's completely related to this idea of being accused of being a racist. Instead of you know, saying we need to reduce numbers, the conservative, uh, you know, leader is trying to accuse the liberal leader of being a racist. I mean, that's really where we are. Um, it's, it's, it's quite ridiculous, but I don't think it's as, as extreme as that in Europe. Do, do you think there can be some sort of an almost unintended consequence of these, of these developments, um, particularly when it comes to the groups, to the minorities that are supposed to be protected by the woke worldview? Uh, just recently, they did a poll in Germany Uh, where among gay communities, uh, apparently now the AFD is one of the top parties for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we see at least the beginning, I would argue, in the United States, a form of a small, we'll see maybe this, this grows, but a small realignment of black and Hispanic voters that seem to be much more comfortable with uh, Donald Trump than they have been with other Republican candidates or the Democratic Party in the past. So do you think that kind of this kind of almost paternalistic approach towards certain groups of society that, that that's you know that it annoys those groups right that they say listen you 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 kind of you use black people you can you know you use gay people you use hispanic people to feel better about yourself right you, know, you declare mm -hmm. us minorities and we need you to protect us but actually we are self confident enough to take care of ourselves so we rather go with uh, you know the trump guy who who might be a little crass in his expressions than the guy who treats us like, like children who cannot take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's driving all of these things, but you're right that there is a shift. I mean, the U.S. is the clearest example of that, where the Latino vote in particular now looks not very different from the white vote. <clears throat> Will, it'll be very interesting to see when we have the election results. But what's happening there, we know that uh, Latinos who are U.S. born, third generation are increasingly more Republican than those who are foreign born. Uh, we know that they're very worried about immigration because a lot of them live in the close to the, even if they're not on the border, I mean, they're relatively uh, southerly in terms of where they reside in the U.S. Um, and so immigration is an issue that his Latinos are caring about. You know, the U.S. Border Patrol has heavily Latino, for example, just as one example. Um, so, yeah, I think, but now what is it that they're reacting against the paternalism? I think it's more that they just see themselves as regular Americans. And so they take the point of view of patriotic Americans. And that's one of the reasons they don't like a, a lawless border. Um, and, they've, and they'll also see things like crime, crime spikes. Um, again, why is there a crime spike? Why is there a lawless border? In both cases, it is because of wokeness. I mean, wokeness was defund the police demoralize the police, led to depolicing, led to more crime. Uh, wokeness means that deporting people or trying to sort of do a remain in Mexico policy for asylum processing is no longer something you do. So Biden rescinds it in a very high profile gesture. That's the cause of what we're seeing on the border. So in both cases, woke is behind the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, I think the, so, so the minorities, you know, so obviously there's a thousands of black people were killed as a result of BLM and Floyd and defund and all of those things because though their areas got more lawless and there was just a lot more killing and accidents and all kinds of things and damaging blighting of neighborhoods. Now, I can't help but believe there is going to be some kind of payback to that uh, for the Democrats. I mean, and, and you mentioned, you know, younger black males drifting away from the Democrats. Actually, if you look at the survey data, I mean, 
Asians, Hispanics, and Blacks since 2008, every election moving more and more away from the Democrats. That is devastating because the U.S. is a very finely balanced political, you know, in terms of public support, the parties are very close and most voters don't move election after election after election. One of the groups of voters that can move is minorities. They've been a little bit less ideological and political. If the Democrats can't count on those minority voters, they're in deep, deep trouble because they're unlikely to get them from anywhere else. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I'm, I just think that Trump has to be right now. I mean, he's, despite his completely um, he's completely unscripted and he says crazy things, but right now he has to be the favorite, uh, you know, um, and that's crazy in a way, if you think of how many flaws he has as a human being, uh, and it's on the back, a lot of, uh, a lot of it on this, uh, shift in the minority vote, which is quite interesting. Yeah. It, it reminds me a little bit, uh, of the, the, the German communists in the 1980s, uh, that kind of lost their patience with the German working class because they voted either conservative or social democrat because they no longer believed in the proletarian revolution and all these these kind of things. And a little bit sometimes I feel the relationship is drifting into this direction as well with kind of the woke elite uh, and the minorities they claim to represent that they simply don't care, or at least some of them, they don't care about this uh, as much as they, as they think. Now, as my concluding question, a very important one, what is the Center for Heterodox Social Sciences? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, just uh, for your listeners, you know, I was at uh, I, I was in mainstream universities as an academic for 24 years. I've been a professor since 2011 at Birkbeck University of London. Uh, in 2023, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons, including, by the way, you know, I experienced a number of Twitter mobbings. I experienced at least three or four internal investigations spurred by radical faculty, radical students, and also complaints coming from outside the university, basically all around my sort of mocking of the social justice movement on Twitter, basically. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, it wasn't enough to push me out on its own. And, and you know, it, this all started in 2018. So, I mean, I was there for five more years. But... I was also aware that, you know, Buckingham, the University of Buckingham was the, you know, it had been founded by Thatcher, even though most of its academics and students actually lean left like anywhere else. But you had a few institutes, a few people there who were unconventional. And the leadership was very much a pro-free speech kind of pro-academic freedom. That's the most important thing, not social justice. So it's the only one of 181 institutions in Britain where there's a chance of setting up something different in academia and higher ed. I think that's quite important for for Britain, first of all. Um, and so I had talks with the vice chancellor and over a number of years. Uh, and I kind of thought, you know, once my university that I was at was entering into financial troubles, and I thought, ah, you know what, if I'm ever going to go, now is the time to go. So what I've done is I've set up a couple of things. One is I've got an open online course on woke, which anyone anywhere in the world can take. You just go to my Twitter profile and you can sign up. Um, so that's the only, the first Western University course on woke. Secondly, um, I've set up this Center for Heterodox Social Science. And what the analogy here is a ski hill where all the skiers have been going in one area. You, you'd understand this well from where you, <laughs> you know, from where you're from. But yeah, all the skiers are going down uh, one place, and then there's all this off piece that nobody's been on because you're not allowed to go there. You're not allowed to study, for example, um, gap, you know, income gaps between races or, or between men and women, and explain those um, any other way than saying it's due to systemic discrimination. It's just not allowed, right? So if you were to go in and say, well, no, actually, you know, it's got to do with family structure and attitudes towards savings and whatever, and that changes over time. But hey, we have to look at culture. You know, that would be seen as, as a no-no. You're not going to get published. Um, and so all of these questions have been either taken off the agenda or you're only allowed one viewpoint. The orthodox uh, dogma is the only thing you're allowed to, to say. And so what that means is there's a huge area of knowledge production that's been completely neglected, that that off piece part of the ski hill. And that's kind of where I want to go. So what I'm trying to do is raise some money. If I can, it's not easy, but do that. And, and through teaching income and attracting research fellows to try and start uh, skiing that part of the hill and trying to sort of 
take an unorthodox approach to social science. And that's something that is much rarer, by the way. So in the US, for example, we have a lot of centers to study the American Constitution and we, you know, uh, Western civilization, the classics. So there is a sort of movement, which I very much approve of, these classical uh, centers and the focus on, you know, classical liberal values in the Constitution. But what we don't have a lot of is uh, heterodox, countercultural social science, um, where there's really a, on, on really quite edgy questions. And that's really where all of the focus is going to be on these sort of relatively hot kind of third rail type, not, not, not necessarily the most controversial, but all these things that have been neglected. And so it's distorted our entire knowledge base. What we know about the world is so distorted because of what academics have been focusing on. So that's the hope. I mean, it's just a, we have a website, heterodox.com, or her, sorry, <laughs> heterodox center with an R-E, heterodoxcenter.com. Um, and we're going to put out reports. We're going to be, yeah, we'll publish some articles and there will be conferences and things, but I'm hoping this will be the beginning of something that will grow, you know, in five years that will be at a larger size. Well, on that note, we'll definitely put all the information, both to your Twitter account, uh, to the Center for Heterodox Social Sciences. Everything of that will be uh, in the description. So every one of you who watches or listens to this on YouTube, just scroll down and you'll find the links there. Take a look, support Eric's work. I think, as you said, this is very important work. Uh, there have been too many untrodden paths in the social sciences over the last couple of decades. Uh, and you have been a trailblazer in the past. And it looks like you plan to continue this role. Uh, and we'll happy and we hope that we can support you in this endeavor as much as possible. Eric, thank you so much for coming on. I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, Ralph. It's been a pleasure.